So I always start with this slide because it's true, because it's important, and because you always think it won't happen to you and it will happen to you. Uh, what saved me as an investor was that I, when I started, there was no uh, CFDs, futures. I was trading options, and therefore you can only lose what you start with. Your risk is 100%, but never underestimate. You can lose more than you start with. That is real, it is painful, and it is no fun for anybody. So don't think, no, no, I'm special. You're not special. You and your money are easily parted. And this is some, a comment from Van K. Tharp, who's well worth uh, reading uh, as a trader. We don't trade the markets, we trade our beliefs about the markets. In other words, we trade our biases. And that's the hard part around trading. And I'm going to come back to it because as we sit right now in the first pandemic in over 100 years, we are very much, you know, markets are going crazy. They're the most expensive they've been in a decade. None of that makes sense. But there's only one right side of that trade right now, and that is to be buying this market. If you're not buying the market, you're, you're simply not in the game. Um, so it's not about the markets. It's about our beliefs. It's about our biases. And I'm going to come back to that a lot more in, in, in next, next month's event, but nonetheless. And, and, and risk. What is risk? So, yeah, risk is that we might lose some money. The risk is we might lose more than we start with. The risk is we might make more money if you put it in the bank rather than being a trader. All of those are true, but really risk is the chance that your actual return will be different than what you expected your return to be. You entered a trade and you had an expectation about what your return will be in that trade. The risk is it's different. Now, that could be that you make less. It could be that you make more. But truthfully, the part you're focusing on here is that you lose money. You never enter a trade expecting to lose money, but you don't actually enter a trade expecting to make money either. In an ideal world, I'll come back to that. Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone. There is a book you must read and read repeatedly, Trading in the Zone. When you genuinely accept the risks, you become at peace with any outcome. And that's what my perfect trade is about, and I'm going to talk about that in detail in a bit so we can park that there for now. But let's kick off with the only truth you're going to find in markets. There is a lot. I mean, let's pause a moment. This industry, the, the financial services industry globally produces more content than any other industry or sector. Sports probably is second. Yeah, lots of sports, particularly in the American sports where they go into the, the nuance and the minute detail about averages and this and that and all the rest. So sport creates a lot, but the financial services industry creates magnitudes more. I mean, if we go back to the 80s, there were broadly the same number of stocks listed globally as there are now. In some markets, a little bit less, but broadly the same number of, of stocks. The commodities were all there. There's no new commodities we've discovered, crypto, but, you know, it was... But back then, I mean, in South Africa, there was no radio shows, TV shows. There was uh, two weekly publications, Financial Mail and Finweek, and that was it. In the U.S., there wasn't much more. There was a TV show. It was an hour a week. Now we have wall-to-wall, 24-7 TV. We have got Twitters. We have got blogs. We have got websites dedicated to it. We've got daily publications, weekly publications. There is a ton of noise, but there's one truth, and that is the price. The price is right. You might not agree with it, but it is right. And why is it the price the only truth that we have? Because understand how a trade happens. A transaction is two parties, a buyer and a seller, and they agree to transact at a price. That is true. They both think they're smarter than the other person. They both have a view. They both got to that view via different ways. But that price that happened, the last traded price, is true. And we, we, we want to fight it. And if you're going to fight at that price, if you're going to say this market is crazy, you're going to get hurt. The trading is simple. Where is the price going? Hop on that bus. Right now, in the US, price is going higher. We can all debate why. We all have opinions as to why. We can say it's illogical. We can say it's crazy. We can call it dangerous. We can agree with it and say this makes perfect sense. None of that matters. All that matters is the price is going up. If it was going down, well, then quite simply, you'd be short. And if it's going up, you wish to be long. It is that simple. Everything else in the market is an opinion. I have opinions by the dozen. What matters is, what did I buy? What did I pay for it? Then I'm showing you truth. So don't try and fight the price. Accept it. That's how we make money in the market. We look at it and we say, is this going up or down, or am I undecided? I call it the six-year-old test. You know, get a six-year-old, show them a chart, and say, where's this going? And they, in a second, will tell you. They'll say, it's going up. 
don't understand the question. This seems like a, a silly question. This is going higher, and uh, we want to be owning it, please, very much. Or it's going lower. Or they look at the chart, and they all squiff, and they're like, actually, I don't know where it's going. This is confusing. Oh, then you stay away. The price is the only truth. Everything else is an opinion. So then I bring you to a process matrix. This was done by a colleague of mine, Manfred Harbeck, when I was running uh, SA Warrants, who are going back now almost 20 years, in fact. Um, and, and Manfred was a, a pro he was a rocket scientist. I mean, he literally, he worked for Denel for a while and made, made rockets. So he really, really was a rocket scientist. Um, and we came up with this process matrix, which is the components we need in order to be a successful trader. And there are five components, goals, discipline, money management, resources, and a trading system. And if you've got all five of those, you can be a successful trader. If you're missing one of them, never mind two or three of them, if you're missing just one of them, you're going to be confused. You'll be inconsistent. You'll be anxious. You'll be frustrated. You'll be totally lost. You need all five goals, discipline, money management, resources, and a system to properly make this work and to properly become a successful trader. So let's delve into each of those and drill into them. Goals. The problem with goals is that we make them these giant, big, terrifying things we're trying to achieve. So your goal as a trader is to be a billionaire in a, in a, in a strong currency. I mean, pick your currency, whichever one you prefer. And that's perfectly fine. But the problem is, is that let's assume that you become a billionaire from trading in, I don't know, let's pick Swiss franc for the heck of it. Zim dollars wouldn't count, no. You become the billionaire, but how quickly is that going to happen? I mean, unless you're starting with, you know, 2 billion, it's going to take time, which means you don't get the affirmation. The point of a goal is that you need to feel that you are succeeding. You need to be moving forward. You need to be getting that affirmation coming back to you constantly that you are moving towards your goal. If you go to these uh, uh, motivational speakers who typically are actually just trying to upsell you something else, but they always tell you is have this giant goal, focus on it, think of nothing else and make that your life's ambition. And you put posters on your wall and everything like that. And that's great. But you're not getting the daily constant affirmations that we need around successful goals. So we need to make our goal bite size. We need to make a goal. If you're a newbie to trading, uh, your first goal can be, well, open a demo account and get proficient with the platform. That's something that's perfectly achievable. Uh, save up enough capital to start trading something that's perfectly achievable. So you're constantly achieving your goals, and as you're achieving them, you're getting affirmation. You're getting that sense that you're moving forward. You can constantly measure yourself against your goals, and that then creates habits, and habits create discipline. Discipline is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. That needs to be one of your goals is that replicable nature of your, of, of, your, of your trading. If you're all over the place, and sometimes you trade, you do a trade because David Shapiro tweeted something, and then another time you do a trade because you read an article on Zero Hedge, and then a third time you do a trade because, well, you were showing someone how to use the platform. How do you repeat any of that? Your goals become habits, your habits become discipline, and discipline becomes successful trading. And to my mind, one of the best goals is that idea behind a perfect trade. This is something I've been talking about for years and years. So every trade I do, and whether it be a 10-minute scope on the Aussie futures in the morning, or you know, I've currently got a, a put option on the top 40 expiring in December, every time I do a trade, I mark it out of those seven points. Did I get the signal? Was there a signal which I got? Did I wait and enter on the confirmation? I always use a two-step entry. I'll come back to that in a second. Was my position size correct? Was my stop loss set before entry? Was the trade monitored correctly? Did I adjust stop loss accordingly during the trade? And did I exit as per the system? Now, a couple of points. I do a two-step entry. I get a signal, I get confirmation. Typically, my confirmation is quite easy. If I get a buy signal, I want the market to be green, and then I'll get in. So if I get a buy signal tonight to, that says go and buy something, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, I'm going to go and buy something, and tomorrow I want it to be green. Why? Wind at my back. So I always do that two-step process. What it does is it gets me into less trades. But you know what? Every trade I get into that I don't get into would have been a loser trade. Because if it's not green tomorrow, maybe it's green Friday. And if my trigger is still active, then I get in on Friday. If it never confirms that was a losing trade, I didn't get into. So I do less trades, and it slightly pushes my win-loss ratio up. 
I also only exit on stop loss. I am a trend trader. I trade trends. The thing with trends is that they nearly always run way more than you ever expect. I mean, look at the S&P, look at the NASDAQ, uh, look at the top 40, uh, look at our mining counters, Anglo Gold Ashanti, you know, uh, look at the stocks going on the downside. You know, we, we see a trend happening and we think, oh no, but it's already run 10, 20, 30, 50, 100%. There's, there's no more money left to be made. Nonsense. Go look at the Capitec share price. Listed at a buck almost 20 years ago, trading at 20 rand in 2008, 9, uh, hit 1,500. Just because a stock has doubled and doubled again, and even if it's a 10 bagger, doesn't mean it, it's got momentum behind it. Trade that momentum. And therefore, I'm not going to try and call a top on this. I'm not going to say this can't go higher. Things can go as high as they want. Now, there's a point where they can't go lower. They get to zero, you can't go lower. Well, actually, oil went negative. So that, aside from oil and interest rates, things don't go negative. So they go to zero, and that's the bottom. But if things are moving up, there's no, there's no limit to how high they can go. They can become irrational. They become crazy. They become ridiculously expensive. But that doesn't mean that they can't continue moving higher. They can absolutely be doing that. And here's the very important point, no mention of profit or loss. You know why? Because all of those seven points that I use there, I control. Profit or loss in an individual trade, I have, when I enter a trade, I don't know if it is going to make me or lose me money. I can do everything right, and I might not make money. And that's a very, very important distinction, that just because we do everything as per our system doesn't mean we are guaranteed profit. My systems typically run at about a 40 to 50% win ratio. It means I make money half the time, a little under half the time which means I lose money half the time or a little over half the time. I can do everything right and still lose money. That's what the Mark Douglas quote up front talks about. When you genuinely accept the risks, you will be at peace with any outcome. I know what I can control. And as long as I'm controlling what I can, I'm at peace with what will happen. I'll have losing trades from time to time, but I know that over the longer term, I will have a winning portfolio, a winning strategy. That's what matters. The profit or loss is not what we control. Any individual trade is, you know, you can, everything can go right and then, you know, someone tweets something or, you know, a pandemic gets announced or whatever the case may be. You know, a hurricane, a, a fukushima. I mean, there's, there's so many things that can happen that are completely beyond our control. So manage what we can. And that's why when we look at the discipline, it seems so wide and vast, but actually it's quite easy. Narrow it down to what you can manage, do the right thing at the right time for the right reason every single time. Consistency of action, consistency of thought. That process of consistency will bleed its way into your trading and ultimately will make you a better and a profitable trader. And that's why, so one of your goals needs to be one perfect trade. Again, don't say, oh, I'm going to do a hundred perfect trades. Nonsense. Do one. Just one perfect trade. Having done one perfect trade, tweet me at Simon PB and then do a second perfect trade. Because when you tweet me, I'm going to say, congrats, awesome, excellent, well done, congratulations. Do a second and then a third and then a fourth. And so it goes. And your aim is to become the Hashim Amla of perfect trades. You want to not be doing 100 and just getting a modest century. You want triple centuries. Heck, the Brian Lara, 501 of them. You want to be that level of consistency. And I'm going to come back to it when we talk around Maslow and his, his, his theories of competence um, and, and how we learn and how we move between those stages. But as we do this and it becomes that discipline, it becomes second nature. It becomes a habit. Trading becomes easier. It becomes less stressful. And truthfully, ultimately, it becomes boring. If you're having fun trading, you're probably losing money. And then you keep a journal, notes, lots of notes. You can do this pen and paper. You can do it Excel spreadsheet. You can do it in OneNote. You can do it in Tot. You can do it in anything. Keep notes as you're learning, as you're improving. Record your trades, the what, the whys, the whens. But as you have thoughts, as you do things, as you have bad days and good days, note them down. 
and then reread that journal. Go back to it. It helps you see what your improvements are. It helps keep you on the straight and narrow. It helps, you, it, it helps work out your bad habits. It helps to keep you disciplined. Trading is work. It's a job. It's like any other profession, any other business, any other career. There's work to be done. There's, there, there, there's, there's effort. There's, you know, if you wanted to you know, make the perfect croissant, if you wanted to be a brain surgeon, if you wanted to be a plumber, if you wanted to be a trader, all of those have the same starting point. You don't know how to do it yet. But they also have the same process, which is you can learn those skills, but understand you need to learn them. Understand that you're going to make mistakes. Understand you're going to run into brick walls and it's going to seem impossible. And when you do run into brick walls, you go back to your journal. You learn how to navigate out, reverse, and go down a different hole. And when you hit walls the third or fourth time, you know that you've hit them before. And you can find, how did I get out of this one? What was the problem? What was the stress point? How did I make it work? So keep that journal, keep it updated, and reference back to it. Now, I, 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 I use an electronic one. Truthfully, I would probably prefer, I'm a, I'm a fan of pen and paper, but for practical purposes, my journal has been uh, electronic for forever and a day now. You, you can do it in an Excel spreadsheet with tabs. You can do it in Word. You can do it in Google Docs, whatever. But keep that journal and, and, and drop things into it, links, books that you read. Why did you read them? What was great about the book, etc. Risk management, I'm going to do an entire session on risk management because it's so critically important. That is 15 July, details down there. The point of risk management, and traders go wrong for two reasons. They go wrong for the first reason is that they lack discipline, which means they lack consistency, which means they can never ultimately be profitable. And they go wrong and bust out because they don't have proper risk management. There are two components to risk management, position size and stop loss. Position size says you bought X CFDs or lots of FX or contracts on, on, on the index. Why X? Why that number? Why that quantity? And typically, as a newbie trader, we're simply buying too big. We've got too big a position for our portfolio and we get busted out because we get a bad trade and then we get three or four in a row, which are going to happen. We're going to have those losing trades and you're going to have three or four in a row. My record is uh, 12. So you're going to have those run of losers. And if your position sizes are too big, that run of losses wipes you out. Remember, if you lose half your money, You've got to grow it by 100% to get back to the beginning. If you start with 10 grand and you drop it down to 5,000 with a string of losses, your 5,000 has to double, has to grow 100% to get back to where you started. So it's hugely important that you manage that risk size. And as a rule, your trades are always going to be too big. You need to make your trades smaller. When I entered a, 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 a put warrant on the top 40 earlier this week, my position is quite simple. I am holding this until one of two outcomes. Either I've, I've uh, increased my, my uh, position by 400%. In other words, I paid 25 cents. If I can sell for one rand and increase my fourfold, I take the money. Or I hold it until expiry in December and I take zero. So my risk in that trade is 100%. So how do I manage getting into a trade that could lose me 100%? Well, I make it small of my entire portfolio. The second point is stop loss. And stop loss is hard. It's hard because we want to know the holy grail of where to position a stop loss, and there isn't one. It's hard because we will action stop losses and then lose money, and, and the stock will run without us. It's hard because it means we need to act actively take a loss. We need to accept that this trade is going to lose us money. But without a stop loss, you will go bust. That is a guarantee. You will go bankrupt. If you don't have a position, you get into a position and you say, if it goes to here, I was wrong and I will exit. Not, well, the market is wrong and I'll add more money to it. Or, well, it's not looking great so far. Let me give it a couple more hours, days, weeks, whatever the case may be. If you are not ruthless with stop loss, you lose money. That is the end of it. And ultimately, you lose money, you wipe out your portfolio and you have nothing left. So position size and stop loss is critically important. Neither is hard, and, and position size is very, very easy. Stop loss, okay, when I say it's not hard, 
no, that's maybe not 100% accurate, you know, where to position it. And, and I'm going to give you some homework at the end of the presentation. You know, one of the things is just go look at charts and, and on that chart, just make a mark and say, the price won't go here. It won't go there. And mark it and then come back in a week and see where it's gone. Did it go there? Because what your stop loss is saying, you're entering a trade and you're saying the price won't go to that point. And if it does, I, this is the point at which I know I'm wrong. So practice putting marks and charts and saying this is where the price won't go and see how right or wrong you are over time. They're emotionally taxing. They also both reduce immediate profit, particularly position size, because you're going to be trading with smaller positions. So when you have a trade that gives you 20, 30, 40, 100% profit, your profit is going to be smaller because your position was smaller. But remember, no money, no trading, game over. So smaller trades are better. Yes, you make less, but you lose less. And over time, you will make money and your portfolio will grow. As I said, an entire webcast on 15 July where we're just going to focus on risk. I know a lot of folks want the risk process to come up first, but I always put it at the end because there's a lot more to go through before we get to risk. A lot more you need to understand and be comfortable and confident about before we can really get to risk. The other part of that matrix was resources. So resources is actually the easy part. What do you need? You need very little. You need a computer with internet access, truthfully a smartphone, uh, a, a, a tablet. It doesn't need to be a fancy smartphone. You know, MTN and Vodacom sell 100 buck or 200 buck smartphones. As long as they can download the app and you can trade on it, that, that's all you need. You don't need a fancy, giant, high-powered computer. Yeah, I've got the new MacBook Pro 16-inch, blah, blah, et cetera, all bells and whistles. But that's because I compile videos. My, my trading, I could run off my 10-year-old MacBook Air. I don't need anything fancy. You need internet access. Uh, does it need to be stable? Yes. Does it need to be a gigabyte fiber? No. It just needs to be stable. Uh, your LTE, your, 3, your 3G. I mean, I, literally, I'm old enough to have been on the days when I was trying to trade on 2G. That was hard. 3G, 4G, plenty. 5G, overkill. You need an account and you don't you don't need to open a, a real account and throw cash in immediately open the account go to the demo section become a pro on the demo account because the last thing you want is that when you're entering a real trade with real money that you're not quite sure which button to click you need to become an expert on the platform you need capital to trade too small amount of capital means you're doing poor risk management and it means your wipe out. The idea that you can start with a thousand bucks and grow it to 10 and then 50 and then 100 and then a million and ultimately a billion is wonderful. And it's the stuff of movies and books. But the reason it's the stuff of movies is because it is so infrequent. It doesn't happen. You need proper capital. You also don't want too much. If you've got a million bucks and you think, I know, let me try this market thing. Do not come to the market with a million. Because as a newbie, what are you going to do? You're going to make mistakes. The first time you make croissants, they're horrible. No one likes them. You throw them away. When you start trading for the first time, it's going to be an absolute and utter disaster. 10,000 minimum, 20 better. If you're going to trade shares or CFDs, you need 35,000. I know that is a giant pot of money for peeps. And that's part of your homework is get to that point. And in the meantime, there's lots to do while you're saving that cash and that capital. And you need the time to learn and practice. Lots of time. This isn't something, I mean, you, you, you can dedicate an hour a day or two hours a week. That's fine. But understand that this is a skill we need to learn. And like any other skill we need to learn, it's going to take time. And the more time we dedicate it to it, the better. But there's also a finite amount. Don't think, well, I'll spend 20 hours a day. No, because we need to sleep. We need to see our families. We need to work. We need to exercise. We need to do all of those other things. And the last resource you need is broadly a plan. What are you doing in trading? What are you going to be trading? Why are you trading that and not the other one? What type of trader? Swing trader, breakout trader, momentum, trend-based trader? What, what is your plan? Now, what books should you be reading? All of those sort of questions are hugely important. So the resources, none of them are onerous. Cash is a bit onerous, perhaps. None of them are massively onerous, but you need to put the time and the effort in. You know, the problem with trading is it's almost too easy to start. If you wanted to be a brain surgeon, they're going to say, yeah, cool, uh, you know, get 12 A's for matric, go to university, come back in a decade. 
you, know, you want to make croissants. You've got to go buy some kit. You're going to have to buy a ton of flour and et cetera, and half a ton of butter and all of that. In the trading space, you basically do your fika docs and you're like, cool, I'm good to go. No, you're not. You're good to lose money. It's too easy to become a trader. And those, you know, the, the, those, those uh, folks on Facebook with the rented fancy cars that they claim are theirs are invariably scams because I can trust you. And I'm so rich that I can buy an island. I'm disconnecting from the interwebs. I'm going to live on an island somewhere. If folks want to visit me, you rent a private jet and come visit me that way. And then you need a system. You need something that tells you what and when to buy or what and when to sell, or what and when to do nothing. Going long, going short, or sitting on the sideline because nothing is apparent to you at this point in time. You need a system to trade. And this is where we get tripped up. We get tripped up in lots of places, but this is where you really get tripped up. You think that the system is the holy grail to everything. It's not. Your holy grail is risk and discipline. Managing your risk and being a disciplined trader. Those are your holy grails. The system is just a way to get you in or out of the market. Van K. Tharp, in the latter part of the 90s, traded uh, individual stocks on the S&P 500. He used to come into work and throw a dart at the wall where it landed. That's the stock he would be trading. Toss a coin, heads he goes long, tails he goes short. That system made money. Beat the index every quarter for a couple of years. Why doesn't he trade that anymore? Because a 721 or any moving average crossover gives you a slightly better edge than a dart and a coin. And they were not magic darts or coins, of course. We think that the system is where the secret is. This is not the case. The system is your methodology. You can trade on gut, it's not gonna work. You need a methodology. That system will tell you what or when to buy and sell. It keeps you honest. It stops those hope and pray type of trades. And most importantly, it gives you consistency. And a system can be absolutely anything. I mean, literally many, many years ago, 17, 18 years ago, we overlaid a uh, full moon cycles on a goldfields chart. And it was just like every time the full moon came, goldfields changed direction. Did we trade that? No, because it didn't have sustainability. I'm a purely mechanical trader, strong rules-based because it removes me from the process. The weakest link in my trading process is me. I'm the one who's going to make stupid mistakes, do stupid things, and I'll end up costing me money. So I'm a, I'm a, absolutely a rules-based trader. Of course, I made those rules. They're my rules. And I'm very cautious to change them or adapt them. I like my rules to stay in place. What also matters is that we believe intuitively as human beings that complexity is better. We believe that the harder we work and the more complexity we put into it, the better we will do. It's how we were raised. I mean, think about this. Here's something which everyone has told to you, your bosses, your teachers, your parents. In order to succeed, work hard. Work hard, complexity. Not true. Simplicity is what works. Simple things like reversal patterns, MA crossovers, break breakouts, chart patterns. Not complex chart patterns, three wood, what three black crows in a wooded house or something. Simple chart patterns like a head and shoulders, but a proper head and shoulders. A proper head and shoulders where you wait for the net, the net the neckline break. You wait for the retest and the run, where the volume meets the requirements of what a head and shoulders is. Head and shoulders is your most successful chart pattern that we have. It has a success rate of over sixty percent but only if it's properly utilized. In other words, you wait and that the volume confirms and all of those bits, no complexity there. You know, when you get your first software package, you will start adding indicators and oscillators until you get something that looks like a Christmas tree. It's got so many lines and bells and whistles on it. It's not gonna make you money. The more you have on it, if you've got 16 indicators and oscillators on your chart, there are 16 points of failure where you can misread. If you've got one and you're just doing an MA crossover, or even better yet, just price, you've only got one point of, of, of potential failure. And I understand that if I said, I said earlier that the only truth in the market is price, right? There's no other truth, there's only price. If that is our truth, what do indicators, oscillators do? Well, they move you away from the price. 
They take the price, they run it through a mathematical formula, and they give you an output. It's just a derivative of the price, but it's removed from the price. If price is true, why are we moving away from it? When I trade Aussie futures pre-open, I trade between 8.30 and 9. When I trade those Aussie futures pre-open, I have nothing. I have a one-minute chart, bids and offers, uh, and, and last 20 trades. That's all I've got. No indicators, no oscillators. My complicated trading systems are two or three moving averages. Complexity is not going to make you a better trader. Complexity is going to bring errors into the process. Complexity is going to make trading harder and ultimately cost you money. And go and look at those on Twitter. Go find the great traders on Twitter, the traders who constantly make money, not the ones who, who are trying to sell you something, those who are just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Those traders, their systems are simple. And a question just came through now from an anonymous, uh, and the point was, ah, oh, but breakouts don't work anymore. No, breakouts still work. The point is, we get suckered into a failed breakout. What you need to do is distinguish between what is a true breakout and what's a failed breakout. And the easiest way to do that is to say, well, it comes back and tests and then runs again. But you know, if you want to be a breakout trader and your view is that breakouts don't work anymore, of course they still work. Things break up. They break up down, they break up, down, up and down. We need to just recognize the distinction between a fake break and a real break. And that's part of being a trader, part of putting a system together. If you go to justfunlap.com, search trading systems, you'll find dozens of them never pay for a system. And then we get to Maslow, unconscious competence. Maslow we know mostly for his hierarchy of needs, but he did a lot, and the one I'm particularly looking at here is the four stages that we go through as we're learning. We start off, when we are new to anything, we're focusing on trading here, but when we're new to something, we start off, we are unconsciously incompetent. You are useless and unaware. Now, that's none of you here, and I'll come to why in a moment. But that makes perfect sense. We come to something and we think it's going to be easy. We want to make croissants, we want to make beer, we want to be a brain surgeon. We think, how hard can that be? Okay, brain surgery, we think, well, probably it's a little bit hard, but, you know, I mean, be careful, hey? like it's a brain. But we are completely unprepared for the level of hard work, and we are completely unaccepting or unaware of our complete lack of ability. We're useless and unaware, you lose money, you wonder why, you blame the Twitterers, you blame the, the Fed, you blame anybody and everybody, you sure as heck don't take the responsibility yourself. But then one day you wake up and you realize, yo, this is harder than I thought. Boom, you're now consciously incompetent. You're still useless, but you are aware of that fact. And now you're attending this webcast, you're reading books. But what you also believe in now is in complexity. Whereas when you were unconsciously incompetent, you believed in your own ability to innately do great things. Now you think, huh, there's more to this than I thought. So now we believe in that complexity. We move towards that complexity. We start adding bells and whistles. We bring in more indicators and oscillators, more tests and all the like. Does any of that make us better trader? Nah, we start losing less. We start moving forward, but we're still not a great trader. We're still not consistently profitable. And then finally, we become consciously competent. And what we've done here is we've kept things simple. We've realized the biggest risk is us. We've realized that complexity is actually a hindrance and not a help. And we've simplified things down. We've got process. We understand that risk and discipline are the two key components. We've figured our weaknesses and how to remove those from the process. For me, the easiest way to do that in, in, in terms of the trading was be absolutely mechanical-based trader, rules-based trader. And the profits start to flow, but we still make mistakes and we still have stupid trades and we still don't have perfect trades all the time. So we're kind of moving forward, but we're not really making the proper money we expect. I mean, the stats are simple. There's been now three research reports I've seen on this, one from 07, one from 2010, sorry, 2011, and the most recently from 2016. And they uh, analyzed uh, uh, data of, of, of wide swaths of traders, account holders, um, and they basically see three things. About 80% of traders lose money, eight zero percent so eight out of 10. About 15% of traders make money, 
but would make more money if they worked at McDonald's. So that 15% are sitting in the consciously competent. They're making money, but it's not really a large amount. They're not quite there yet. It's nice, but it hasn't replaced an income. That 80% are on the unconsciously incompetent and the consciously incompetent. That final 5% make the money. And understand a lot of trading is zero sum. For me to make 10 bucks, someone out there had to lose it. So if there's 5% of you, 1 in 20, who are making the real money, that's a lot of zero sum money flowing your way. And for that, you need to be unconsciously competent. Trading becomes boring. Trading becomes second nature. You just do it. You enter trades and you're not even quite aware that you did it. This morning I entered a trade, I got into my position, I, I put my exits in, I put my stop losses in, and three minutes later it was like, hang on, did I get in my trade? Because I do it without even really thinking about it. And as human beings, we have the capacity for this. And the best example is driving a car. Think about the first time you drove a car and you had a clutch and all those things to remember. And it just seemed something we desperately wanted to be able to do and something we knew we had the ability to do, but we didn't quite, we weren't there yet. And now we drive without thinking. We're changing gears, we're chatting, we're listening to the wireless, we're going along. We're absolutely doing it without thinking. Now, what happened from that first day when you got into a car and stalled it and studded the car and nearly crashed it to now when it's just something you can do? It's like breathing. It's just second nature. Firstly, you went through that pain process. You were unconsciously incompetent. You became aware of your, of your, of, of your incompetence and you were consciously incompetent. You then became consciously competent, but you were still listening for the revs. Oh, must change gear now and that sort of thing. And then it became second nature. Why did it become second nature? Because it became a habit. How did it become a habit? Repetition. We did the same thing for the same reason every single time. Consistency of action. Every time you approach a stoplight, you brake, you gear down. Every time the revs get to a certain point, you change up the gear. It's something we have done so many times now that we can actually do something else whilst we are driving. We can listen to, ro to the radio or to music. We can you know, take a phone call. I mean, you know, all of those decrease our ability, but we can do driving as a second nature. And the reason is because it is repetition and it becomes a habit. And it happens very quickly. Now, I, I went and got a fancy sports car so that I can have fun driving again. And it is fun driving, but I've got to remind myself, man, this is a roadster. You know, if you're not sliding around the corners and wheel spinning off the stop streets, then I've wasted the money. So we need to get to that point with trading, where trading becomes boring, where it becomes second nature, where it's something we just do, the right thing at the right moment for the right reason. Consistency of action, discipline of the mind. And when we get to that point, then we're an unconsciously competent trader, then we're in that 5%. We're gonna to have to go through the whole process and the risk is that we, st that we start dropping back, that we become unconsciously competent, but then we start to overthink it. Then we have a drawdown and we worry and we start to overcomplicate. We bring complexity back into the equation. We do a bad trade because someone on TV was so convincing that how could they possibly be wrong? So we gotta constantly be guarding ourselves and how do we guard ourselves? Our journal. That's what keeps us honest. Our journal is what keeps us on the straight and narrow. So we need to work out where you are. As I said, you're not unconsciously incompetent because if you were, you wouldn't have given up an hour on your Wednesday evening, even during lockdown. You're at some point in that equation. Identify where you are and how do you get to the next stage. Then quickly, what do we trade? Talked about this in last week's presentation. Quickly want to recap. Shares, crypto, commodities, indices, FX. What we truthfully want is to trade something with low volatility. We like volatility, right? Because if you're on the right side of, the, of, the, of that trade and it jumps 15 or 20%, you're going to make a killing. But sometimes you'll be on the wrong side of the trade. Shares are your highest risk thing to trade because of single event risk. Crypto is just a wild west. Commodities have spiking volatility. Indices are my preferred. Currency is probably best, but it's for the pros. Here's why. Because the big trading houses around the world, JP Morgan, Citi, et cetera, et cetera, they get their best five or six traders. They give them, I don't know, 10, 100 million US dollars, and they say, go trade FX. And that's a zero-sum game. For them to make money, they've got to pick it out of your pocket. 
So FX, when you know what you're doing, start indices. And if you want, you know, and why, don't start with gearing. Starting with gearing is that when you learn to drive, you learn to drive in a Lamborghini at a racetrack. In which case you wrap that car around the first chicane that you came to. If you even got as far as the chicane, I've seen Oaks wheel spin and collapse the car just trying to get off the start. Shares, indices, indices you can trade with ETFs, shares ungeared. Gearing is great, gearing is dangerous. Don't start in the dangerous place, start where it's safer. I'm an index trader, I don't trade equity at all. I haven't traded equity in years, partly when I joined Standard Bank back in 2007, all the compliance and all of those regulation, but also I'd been trading equity for about seven years and I'd been trading indices for the last three of those seven. And I was just like, you know what, the indices are easier, they're less volatile, and I make more money from them. Shares are for the birds. When do we trade? So we're all gonna be day traders, right? We're gonna, you know, Day trading, you know what day trading is? It's a job. You sit in front of your screen from eight until six, you've got admin to do. Day trading, I mean, is there money to be made? Sure. Is it boring and absolutely. Now I was day trading, got so bad I cut my hair, moved to Joburg and joined a bank. So we start off watching intraday. You're gonna, if you're gonna try and trade intraday as a beginner, you're gonna lose money, and if you've got a job, you're gonna lose your job, because you're, you're gonna be spending all your time watching the charts. Day trading is a job. What you wanna be is a lazy trader. I've got my trading down to about 15 minutes in the week, and sorry, per, per weekday. So what are we, five days, it's an hour and a half a week. That's it. And as you move to longer term charts, they become easier, they become less stress. So it's not about having fun. This is about becoming an a, 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 a unconsciously competent trader and making money. Daily charts, weekly charts. You know what I love? Monthly charts. One of the favorite things for me is 12 times a year, we get to month end and I've now got monthly charts. And you can see the trends. You can see the big pictures. Alexander Elder, I, I'm not a massive fan of his writing, although, you know, don't get me wrong, he's probably a better trader and a better tr teacher than I am. But he talks about the three-step process where you start on a weekly chart. And when you get a buy in a weekly chart, you drop down to the daily chart. And when you get the buy in the daily chart, you drop down to the hourly chart. And when you get the buy in the hourly chart, you enter the trade. And the first thing you're going to notice on weekly charts is there's not much action. No, if you want action, go bungee jump. Take up skydiving. Trading is not for action. Trading is meant to be boring. Trading is meant to be something we become unconsciously competent at and we just swim do it. Like driving. Driving is just how we get from A to B. If you want to have fun doing it, you can go get a fancy car. But broadly, it's getting us A to B. Also, as we contract our time frame we're looking at, we do shorter trades, shorter time frame, which means smaller profit which means we've got to be quick on the entry. If I, when, when I'm trading in the morning, my average trade is about 15 minutes, which means if I'm two or three minutes late to enter that trade, it's really hurting my profit. If I'm on a weekly chart and I'm two or three minutes late to enter a trade, no one notices. If I'm an hour late, no one notices. But also the shorter the time frame, the shorter the trade, the smaller the profit, the smaller the stop loss. But it also means that your risk entry, your slippage, your spread become a lot more important. Your cost is the same. If you enter a trade and hold it for a year, or if you enter a trade and hold it for two minutes, you pay the same fee in and out. But the folks who do a trade every day, well, they're gonna do 200 every year. They're gonna pay 200 fees. If you do one trade and hold it for a year, you pay one fee. You immediately 200 fees ahead of the other person. Longer trades, larger profits, less slippage, less entry risk. Same cost of transaction. So I know you're going to start with the intraday. You're going to start watching prices, and that's not a bad thing. Learn price action. Understand how markets act and how they respond, particularly to news flow and the like. But ultimately, you want to pull that out. Unless you want to be a day trader, not recommended, but if you do, you want to pull that out. You want to go to daily. You want to go to weekly charts. And don't forget the monthly charts. They're great fun. So in closing, and then we'll take some questions. Homework. So how much time... Are you going to set aside every week to trading, to learning about trading, to becoming a trader, and ultimately becoming unconsciously competent? Engage your family. You know, you're like, oh, I've got loads of time. Yeah, okay, you've got loads of time, but you've also got to have a life. You've also got a family. You've got a job. You've got a career. You've got the other bits. Be reasonable about this. How many hours can you dedicate on work days? How many hours can you dedicate on, on weekends? 
Do not take a week's leave and think, oh, I'll become a trader in a week. I know far too many people who've done that, and I know exactly zero of them to who has succeeded. So decide that point. How much hours? What hours? Okay, so how about Mondays and Thursdays from 8 to 10 in the evenings, uh, and then Sundays from 9 to 12? Whatever it is. Uh, there's seven hours a week already. Open a demo account and learn the platform. Place trades, hundreds of trades. Why? So that when you're on that platform, you are unconsciously competent. You are placing trades without even aware, aware of it. So that the platform doesn't become a sticking point in your process. Start working with charts. Pull up indicators and oscillators. Draw yourself some trend lines. Just open charts. Doesn't matter what they are. In fact, oftentimes it's better if we don't know what the businesses are because we don't bring our bias. I know someone who trades Singapore equities and indices. Why? Because he has no idea what's happening there. Yeah, I, 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 was, I, I like trading the DAX. Why? Well, because I don't know what's driving the DAX. I don't need to know what's driving the DAX because the price is my truth. So that's what matters. So load up indicators and oscillators. Look at them. Work with them. Play with them. Work out that they're not very much good. Ditto with trend lines. Go find your chart patterns. Google trading systems. See what they entail. Do not pay for a trading system, but see what the trading systems have in their, in their complexity. Find the, 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 the different charting patterns, your rising wedges, your pennants, your triangles, your uh, uh, reversal patterns, your candles, and all of that. So start learning those. Because a large part of learning and getting to a point is to have gone down the path and said, hmm, not for me, backing up and going down another path. Learning is about going down the wrong paths. We need to do that because if you get to the end and you've never gone down a wrong path, how do you know you're at the right end? And then start saving for trading account. 10 is minimum, 20 is better, 35 if you want to do equities. And then in closing, trading is easy. We make it hard. We've got to get to that easy part. Now, anything which a professional does, they look at it and they think, yeah, this is easy. Was it easy when they started? No. It's also trading is not the solution. If you hate your life, if you hate your job, if you're bankrupt or something like that, trading is not your solution to that. There are other issues and you've got to manage those yourself. Trading is a side hustle. If it can become a significant and it can become your primary, it can become your only source of income. It absolutely can. But it's not a solution to a life you hate. And we make it hard. That belief in complexity, that desire to get rich in a hurry. If you want it, there's one way we get rich quick. One way we get rich quick. Marry money. Now we're in lockdown, so I don't know where you're going to find yourself a bride. But that's the only way we get rich quick. Everything else takes time. Greed and fear. You don't understand greed and fear until you're in a winning or a losing trade, and then you will absolutely understand greed and fear, and we'll talk a whole bunch more around that in next month's presentation. Be prepared to spend that time watching the charts. Don't expect to be an expert on day one. How long is it going to take? It's not going to be days and weeks. It's probably not going to be months. It's probably going to be a year. It might be three years. It took me five. And forget the noise. Focus on the price. Price is our truth. What they say on TV, the newspapers, the, the experts on the Twitters, it's, it's, it's of entertainment. But it's not truth. Truth is price. Unless they're telling you gold just traded at 1755. Well, then that is true because gold traded there. But as always, check them on that. Uh, we had this up front, more events coming, as I was saying up front. If you've booked, for example, the Trading 101, you're at today's event, you're automatically booked for the webcast for June 17 and July 15, ditto for the others. Obviously, you need to book for each of the series, the Thought Leader, which is first Wednesday, no derivatives, second Wednesday, Trading 101, third Wednesday. And then there's the Think Markets Explained, how to use the platform, the tools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that happens uh, last Wednesday of every month. Uh, you can sign up for all of those. Links are there. Uh, contact details for Think Markets, disclaimers and all. Let's take questions. 
Uh, Pamela, stop loss, let's say you have set a 4%, but then there is a massive sell off and the stop loss does not trigger. How do you control that to cap the loss? Great question. So it has happened to me more than once in my life. You have a stop loss that's set here, let's say 10 bucks. The share is trading at 10.50 and the next thing is trading at 9.50. How do you manage that? So the first thing you do is you exit at 9.50. You don't just argue it, you take the money and you run. And then what I typically do is that's why when I, and we'll talk about it in the 2% rule, and I'm not saying your stop loss is 2%, I'm saying your capital is 2%, is you know, maybe you make that one and a half to give yourself that little bit of extra wiggle room. But you will sometimes miss stop losses, not because you're a bad trader, but because markets sometimes do that, particularly overnight markets. I need to find my little mouse. Uh, Sebastian, when you speak about daily learning, what would you recommend if you can dedicate, say, half an hour? So, reading. Uh, read books by Mark Douglas. Read books by uh, uh, um, uh, Alexander Elder. Read books by Van K. Tharp. Read books by Michael Koval. Uh, go read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I would read copiously, um, and I would look at charts. Just spend time looking at charts. Just, you know, I used to set myself a target where I would, over a weekend, I would start at A and go through to Z. I would look at every chart on the JSE. And, and then I started realizing that most of those charts were useless just because there wasn't sufficient liquidity. So I made myself a watch list and I would look at those 100 charts at least once a week. Look at charts and draw things on them. Make notes to yourself, either on the chart or in a spreadsheet or whatever. But like, you know, I looked at this chart and I thought I saw this and then just come back to it. Just look at charts and charts and charts and charts. Because if, if price is our only truth, where do we see that price? In the chart. So... Charts, 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 and reading. Uh, good demo accounts. A lot of platforms don't offer demo accounts. A lot of platforms have closed demo accounts during this time because they're seeing such increase. Uh, think markets, great demo account there. Sign up, demo is free. Um, good literature for beginners, Brandon. So I actually thought I had a slide and it wasn't there. So, um, and I'll, I'll say it a little more slowly. Uh, Mark Douglas, uh, trading in the zone. That's an absolute must. Alexander Elder, I've got some issues with him, but he's worth the read. Um, Michael Koval, because he is a trend trader, he's going to try and sell you things. Don't buy those, but he talks about it. Books about the turtle traders, because they were systematic trend traders, and this, the turtle system is available. You can download it and trade it, no problem whatsoever. Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, uh, books by Van K. Tharp. <clears throat> Tweet me, email me if you want. I can send you lists galore. Uh, can I go from 1,000 to 1 million in one month by trading? Uh, no. Uh, short, honest answer. Um, you're not likely, no. Um, spend your 1,000, find yourself a hot wife or husband. A rich one. Sorry, not hot, rich. Uh, trade global ETFs and indices. So if you just want to trade them ungeared, I, any of the web traders, etc., for the ETFs and indices. Herbert, as always, superb, thank you. Time and speed of essence in time trades like your morning, are there better, faster data feeds than 15 minute delayed uh, that we currently freely have? Yeah, so uh, data is typically something we have to pay for or we get delayed. And to your point, you know, if you're trading a weekly chart, 15 minute delays, neither here nor there. Daily chart, hmm, anything shorter doesn't work. Uh, think markets will give you those pricing and they're not going to charge you for it. Value investing, minimum funds needed to invest using this, this method. Value investing, so, so you've run down a different paragraph there. Go to just one lap. Uh, type in value investing. You'll see a couple of webcasts I've done there. Uh, value investing, sure. I mean, people will tell you value has not done great for the last decade. Sure, it hasn't. Um, but is there still methodology there? Sure. I mean, people, uh, uh, RECM, uh, classic value investors, as distinct from momentum traders, uh, value investing. I've uh, got to that one. Sorry, I'm struggling with the system here. Ah, I was in the wrong place. Uh, dismiss that one. Uh, stop loss, what are the things you consider when setting that uh, in Jabula? So the point of the stop loss is to put it where you think the market won't go. In essence, you're trying to hide it. Pretend you are playing hide and seek with the price 
and you want to go to a point where the market is not going to go. And then how do you get good at that? Practice, hundreds of charts, hundreds of charts, place your stop losses. Um, avoid traders hunting the stop and avoid being caught up in this. Ah, how do you avoid traders hunting your stop? You can't. Traders will hunt your stop. If you put them at nice round levels or just below levels, they will hunt you and chase you. How do you avoid it? Don't be obvious. Be hide and seek. You know, hide and seek. The obvious place to hide is the first tree. Hide behind that. That's obvious. Go hide behind, a, don't hide behind a tree. Hide up a tree. Yeah, that sort of thing. And not the first tree. Hide up a tree behind me. So you've got to hide your stop losses, which are not obvious, because traders will hunt you out and shake you out. Absolutely, they will. Uh, Jonathan, a video of topics or research to watch online where it takes you through everything in order start to finish. Uh, JustOneLap.com uh, or go to, go to YouTube, Just One Lap. Uh, search Just One Lap on YouTube. We have literally hundreds of videos. If you want, you can drop me a mail. I'll send you some specifics. Uh, why do you don't pay for a system? Because if I'm selling you a system, I mean, that just to me seems weird. It means I'm probably making money from the system, from selling, not from the actual system itself. The system is either something which people won't tell you about because it works and it's a secret, or a system is something which you give out there, which I do the latter. I've never seen a system to pay for that, that, that fundamentally worked. And truthfully, I've never paid for one, so maybe that's partly why. Uh, my entry system, my entry signals are either simply watch price and who's winning, buyers or sellers. And with practice and experience, that becomes not obvious, but you start to get a sense for that. Um, otherwise, simple things like moving average crossovers and the like. Uh, still use the lazy system. Nope, so I have got laziest as lazier. Um, so oddly enough, actually, the lazy system went into cash in beginning of February um, and has done brilliantly well because it went into cash. It's just given signals on the S&P and some others uh, and I'm not losing the lazy system. If you go to Just One Lap, Google lazy, you'll, I, I give a, I, one of my podcasts I dedicated to how I'm changing my investment and, 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 and my trading strategy and it was to pull because I'm bringing more ETFs into my overall portfolio, I wanted to pull money out of my trading. I wanted to put more into my Aussie, so the lazy system had to go by the side. Uh, Injabula is doing it. You'll find him on the Twitters, uh, and he's also doing a podcast. Tweet me. I can send you his, uh, show you on the Twitters. Uh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I've lost my mouse again. Um, Excluding the tails, what is the average return after costs of a timed intraday index trade like yours? I am targeting 200, sorry, on it, so I enter in blocks of two, in, in sets of two uh, contracts per, per set. So I'm doing six or eight, um, and I'm targeting, so of every two contracts I enter, I'm looking to make 300 points, um, 150 each. I drop the first at 100 profit, the second at 200 profit, trading stop of 100. I'm averaging uh, 94 points per contract. Ben, absolute pleasure. Uh, best technical me me methods to start reading up on, uh, Van K. Thorpe and uh, Alexander Elder. Yeah, so last week I said that if you've got 10K and take a 70K position because of gearing, uh, sees where, and you lose it, does that mean you have to pay the broker 60K? Yes. If you don't have it, well, you owe the broker money. I mean, they have a legal right to, to liquidate you, to take your assets, and, and that is the real risk of the equation. We're going to talk a lot more about that in next month's sessions, but yeah, that is your risk in gearing. Uh, doom, doom, doom. What time frames do I use the most? I'm either using minute or weekly, which I know are the two extremes. My aim is, is what I like about what I'm doing with the Aussie is I sit down at half past eight and sometimes I don't get there in time and I'm done by about quarter or 10 to nine and now I've got my day free. And then weekly stuff, I look at in the weekends, nice and simple. Uh, what charting tools am I using? So literally I'm just using price action or moving averages. I uh, need to buy specific uh, software. Now, David, uh, your broker will provide it and it should be free. Think Markets will give it to you for free, no questions. Um, they have ETFs and not ETNs on Think Markets. Uh, I've always uh, dropped them a mail. Uh, where are the contact details? Uh, quite possibly they don't have, quite possibly they can. Uh, Jürgen, absolute pleasure. 
uh, trading robots that automatically place trades for you. I don't. They certainly are there. Uh, they require, that's quite advanced trading. I'm going to touch on it in one of my sessions next month, but that's proper. Do you tweak your stop losses based on liquidity or volatility? Yes, Rian, I would. So high liquid stocks, uh, low vol stocks, I'm going to, uh, one of the things I like to use is look at average true range. ATR, stop loss of twice average true range is a good point to go. Um, a more volatile stock needs a bigger stop loss, just as simple as that. Uh, Clive, your broker would in all, in all likelihood, if you've put in back, we're back to the question C's we asked. You put in 10,000, you got 70,000 exposure. The broker is going to do everything in their power to close you out when you get to zero. But let's say something crazy happens and, and you know, the trade was there and now it's there. Uh, they will close you out as close to zero as they can. But if they can't, then it is, then it is not important. Uh, and then there were some questions coming through on the chat. Uh, yeah, all recordings are available. You'll find it at just onelap.com slash thinkmarkets, uh, that link there. All the videos are available and also on the Think Markets. Uh, what charting tools am I using? I just use my brokers. I don't need anything particularly simple. Um, Broke charges, do all brokers charge the same spread if they're giving you DMA? Yes, they are. But it's one of the things to check out. I mean, yeah, go check your different brokers. Check what they're charging. Two brokers offering the same product, see what their spreads are. Narrower spreads are better. We talked about that a lot in last week's one. You'll find that at justonelap.com slash thinkmarkets. Uh, swaps, Bruno, I, I haven't done swaps. I mean, I, I, me, for me, swaps are, are something that's always been beyond my remit. Uh, and I'm never quite, I mean, I get the profit from it, but I'm, I mean, do my, I, I, I've had no need for them. And I've always viewed them as something which, you know, if you need swaps, they have a purpose, otherwise not. Uh, Barry, absolute pleasure. Uh, do you, it's, uh, hitting, we're hitting my time here. So I'm going to park that there. There are a couple more questions coming through, but contact details are there. My battery is going flat, which is very, very awkward. Ladies and gents, we will park that there. You're welcome to contact me. If you've got further questions around the platform, contact Think Markets. We'll be back again next week with Red One. Everyone, have a great evening further. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Cheers, all.